Awesome. Well, good. So um, typically we have not done class on the day of summit, but uh, for some reason I decided to, I thought, well, we'll just throw in the dot Lutheran's app. So I don't know if it's a good idea or not. I guess we'll decide uh, after today. But anyway, so uh, anything exciting happened? Any good wins or successes taking place? Okay. <laughs> it's the new year. We can take the past and not worry about it and move forward. That that's, is a, that's a that's plus. That's a win, yeah. That's a win. Yeah. New year. New exciting things. New opportunities. Good. Yep. <clears throat> Nobody's got anything, huh? All right. Had some appointments cancel on me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I, you see, I'm not sure that's a win, is it? I don't know. Well, good. Okay. Well, I guess um, we'll let. Do you want to go first, Gail? Sure. All right. So, yeah. so we've got Gail from Vanguard here, um, and I guess we'll let you take it away. Hey. Hi, guys. Good morning. Happy New Year. Um, I am Gail from Vanguard. I'm just filling in for you guys at last minute. Just found out. So I don't have any pass out, any flyers or anything for you. See a few familiar faces. Um, not sure where you're at in your training, but one thing I wanted to mention to you, have all of, or any of you learned, when we send you a PR, so you finally get a listing and we finally get the PR going and we send that to you, how many here have actually learned how to read a title report? <laughs> My veteran girl. The one that's experienced. <laughs> so, that well, which uh, <laughs> Thursday actually Sue is teaching class, so she's going to go through all She through is? Yeah. I just want you to know that there is quite a few of us upstairs at Vanguard. There's always someone that um, can answer your questions up there, whether it be title or escrow. And um, I would be glad if you want, I can just take one of my PRs and mark out the information, you know, for one of my clients, and I would be glad and happy to sit down with you and teach each and every one of you what I look for on a PR, the red flags to look for, the things that are just normal like your right-of-ways and your mineral rights, um, and then kind of watch out for your judgments, any old trustees, because you'll have a client say, oh, my house is all paid off. And you get the PR and like, whoops, it really might be. But there's a deed of trust on there, and that deed of trust could have been paid years ago, but nothing was followed through as far as the company they paid getting them the reconveyance, which is the document that removes that from our public records. I can walk through all of that with you. Don't ever feel hesitant that you can't walk up and just ask the front desk at any time if any of us are available. I know Wanda and I, we bounce stuff off each other sometimes. She works with Tracy, but if Tracy's not there, we'll bounce stuff off each other. That's what we're there for. We're there to make your business grow, and we've all been exactly where each one of you are, new and need to have our training. Wanda? It's so important. I'm surprised how many agents don't read the PRs. Mm -hmm. That is an obligation and a responsibility as an agent to read it. You don't just depend on them. It's not that they're, they don't know what they're doing, but it's our responsibility to read it and, and again, find out what some of the stuff means because it's going to be, a, it could be a difference between the transaction going through and a possible lawsuit. I mean, it's just that important. So, any questions that I know we want to keep it short? Any questions that you guys have for me right now that I could answer? Maybe something else off of the line of the commitments that something's come up that you guys want me to answer right now? It's hard, because unless it comes up, you don't know to ask the question, okay? So feel free, we're always up there. There's always going to be someone who can help you, okay? We have great eyes, too. We have the shaved eyes kind of stuff. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, hey, Gail. Thanks. Appreciate it. Good luck, guys. Okay, <laughs> Jeff. I don't think they're bored of them yet. I took two hours last week, so. <laughs> Erica probably, wasn't here, so she... You probably heard enough. Was, it was too... <laughs> <personal>. <laughs> um, too much. We have, you guys may have noticed we've talked about about skies falling over the last couple of months, election and all the interest rates climbing. Cool things are happening. We're actually seeing some retraction on some of those feelings. And we talked during the, the two-hour class last week about FHA and HUD and their feelings on where the market is going and how profitable, 
it is for them to run a mortgage insurance division, which is really what FHA does, FHA, VA, and all GOVI programs. I talked about the excess that FHA has in their MI account right now. We're seeing on the 27th of this month, they're going to reduce their monthly MI by a quarter of a percent, which is huge. Um, that actually means on a $200,000 loan, the payment will go down $41. Wow. This is a big deal. Now, not only is it a big deal from the standpoint that we have a lower payment obligation, and it helps your DTIs, this is a trend of the government saying, you know what, we've got five years, we've got really six, seven years since the mortgage meltdown. What we've done in that time period to create good loans is paying dividends. In other words, we can put confidence into our marketing. So the big message here is, yeah, we're seeing a reduction in, in mortgage insurance payment, but the, sa the thought here is the confidence is increasing. We're going to see, what you'll see after this stuff is maybe some relaxation in, in um, underwriting guidelines, maybe a little bit of uh, expansion on programs. This is the trend. This would be the first thing that they move. The trend then leads to better underwriting. So I think we're heading in a really good direction. Boy, there may have been you know, this feeling like, oh, woe is me the last couple of months, but some good things are happening. I think we're going to see some really good things happen in this market. Um, some of us in the market would think that we've had a really good couple of last few years and the market has been robust. We've done that in the face of the strictest regulations our industry has ever seen. So think about a little bit of, uh, of relaxing of those regulations, a little bit more aggressiveness by the lenders. Imagine what that opportunity opens to you guys. You're getting into the business at an incredible time. There will be some amazing opportunities for you. So any questions about that? Does that make sense? Do you understand what we're talking about when the mortgage insurance monthly obligation? You're, you're an expert, yeah. No, if you currently have a mortgage, no, your your uh, MI will stay the same. So, so this is for originating the loan going forward. Oh, okay. So, but the same reduction in MI is allowable for someone who streamlines or refinances on an FHA. But once you have a mortgage in place, that MI will stay in place. I have seen it seems like about five six years ago that they did a retroactive adjustment to MI, but this one is not one. Okay, this is just going forward. Now, currently, MI is for life of the loan on FHA. Right. We probably told you that before. Probably doesn't hurt to keep telling you, but it's for life of the loan as opposed to a conventional loan. Their MI is only for, you have a, you have a contract for two years on a conventional loan that you cannot request out of that other than a refinance. Um, but FHA is for life of the loan. And that's a very expensive, if it were to actually play out that way. And I've said this many times, it used to be life of the loan 10 years ago and they changed that retroactively. This is a sign of moving the right direction. They've lowered the MI. I believe you will see, this is my prediction, in the next few years, they will adjust the life of the loan obligation on FHA. Good. I really believe that. So this is a really good sign. I hope you guys are feeling the momentum of coming into 2017. You guys have made a great decision to get into this business. It is going to pay huge dividends if you work hard and you're doing it at the right time. There are people as confidence is increasing in our economy. The lending side is actually becoming more aggressive. It's a great time to be a real estate agent. Any questions? Any concerns? Everything going great? <coughs> I wish I had a lot of questions, but I, I, if I understood it better, then I would be able to ask a lot more. Mm -hmm. that, that, is, that is so correct, because without having a basis of understanding, go, what does that really mean? Yeah. And, and what it really means is affordability. Um, like I say, you know, we're, we're sometimes struggling so much to get your people qualified. That debt income, debt income ratios, they're hard and fast. When we do an automated underwriting, it finds a number and it says you must qualify under this ratio. $41 a month is huge. I mean, it really is. For someone who's, you know, eight points away from qualifying, it doesn't matter. Eight points away in debt ratio. But if we have people that we literally asking them, hey, go find the money and pay off your American Express card. The twenty-five dollars a month, so you can credit, so you can qualify. This is forty-one dollars. So no, I, I sort of have a question. So if they've locked a loan in before, what is the date again? The twenty-seventh. Twenty-seventh. Yeah. If they've locked a loan in and they haven't closed on the home until after the twenty-seventh, can they still use that? Yes. That. 
We're going to go on the date of closing. So if you okay. close 27th. So then it can change even though they've locked the loan in. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a great deal. Yeah, there's always a little bit of, of there's always a little bit of leniency on those hard and fast dates because what they're doing is they're going out. If someone is going along and go, hey, I'm closing on the 26th, I have to close on the 26th and you're gonna help me out. We're not out to you know, there's there's gonna be some leniency. This isn't one of those, hey you missed the cutoff, you're dead. <laughs> so um, yes. Okay, so on a <clears throat> on the um, the uh, CDs, the closing documents, what is the rule on um, the uh, either the dollar amount or the percentage that has is going to be diff might be quoted different than what it really is in order uh, that a new CD has to be sent out? It's an eight. What are the what are the criteria? What's that's, the criteria? That's an eight, which is point one two five percent. Um, that, that, that and what is that on, based on? Based on the closing cost mm -hmm. estimate that we gave you. So on the, on the front end of a loan, we're going to give you what's called an LE, it's a loan estimate. And that will give you an estimate of the closing cost relevant to doing that particular purchase. A couple of those fees within that co closing cost have zero tolerance. So that's, that's when you need to understand. If some of them are zero tolerance, some of them are an eighth tolerance. The ones that are zero tolerance are related to specifically fees that we as a lender collect. We have no leeway whatsoever. When I, when I disclose to you on the front and I have to do it within three days of having six items of your information, once I have that, I have to give you those. My numbers have zero tolerance. Now, we deal with third party vendors in every transaction, appraisers, lenders, I mean, I mean appraisers title, what have you, credit. Those fees have a tolerance. Okay, and those are the tolerance numbers we're talking about. But as far as our fees as a lender, there's zero tolerance. Okay? And it's a very good thing. I think we talked about this a couple weeks ago. That's a very good thing. I've done this for 24 years, and I have seen people change those numbers on the day of closing. And you showed up to close, and you had a contract obligation, and you couldn't get out of it, and all of a sudden you find out your fees had gone out, and your rate went up. That's just wrong. That's dead wrong. And so this was... Trin did a huge thing on this one. I'm not a huge fan on all of their things, but this protects our clients immensely. So, yes. Okay. You please ask. You're fine. Um, so on a VA loan, um, the lender, or excuse me, VA requires a termite inspection. Yes. Who is responsible normally for paying for that? Well, we like to say that it's the seller. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you this, that it's become a point of negotiation many times because a lot of times the original contract is not, has not addressed that issue. Now, VA wants the seller to pay for it. But basically what they're saying is not who we want to pay for it, it's who cannot pay for it. And that is the borrower, right. the buyer. They cannot pay for that. So what you'll find happening in this case is it will come down to the case of a VA that's very tight on money and everybody goes back and says, okay, who's going to pay for it? Well, that's a point of negotiation, but we know who's not going to pay for it, and that's the buyer. So should that be addressed in the FHA? 100%. 100%. And the reason why, the reason why that should be addressed on the front end is because when that becomes a point of negotiation, guess, guess who gets part of that payment? You do. Most likely. Most likely, or the lender, or whoever. It's a point of negotiation. We just know who's not going to pay for it. We have two realtors and a lender. And that fee is going to get paid by somebody. And usually who orders that? Uh, we as a lender do. Because hmm. I have a lender who's said they don't know, because they're out of state, they don't know who to contact and that they put back on us and I thought, mm -hmm. is well, there a conflict there because of that or is that a big deal? There is and, and he may not have worded it correctly. He may have been asking for your help because it is very... <laughs> I advise people to use a termite inspector that they have some confidence in. And you can ask around your office generally and find someone who will say this is very good for doing termite inspections. Someone out of state is probably a little concerned. They may have worded it better, like, hey, could you help me? But we as the lenders, we have the obligation to ensure that that termite inspection is in the file. If we're not on top of that, what are we going to do? Wait till the end and, hey, we don't have a termite inspection. So it would be irresponsible for us as a lender not to be in the middle of that. I can see asking a realtor to help. Okay. But no, that's our Joel Rowley. What's that? Joel Rowley. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, you can ask around an office and people will know. And they're <laughs> this good to use recommended people. Okay. So, Thank you. anything else? Sorry I'm taking so long. No, you're good. I told, I told Russ last time, I said, how do you do this? I came in here for two hours and spoke and my jaw was hurting. <laughs> he does this every day. <laughs> Not every day. Well, he does it twice, <laughs> twice a week. Yeah. So, Okay, and you awesome. just appreciate Russ. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. so one last thing before we jump into class, and I've got Joe Reardon that wants to. He's one of the top team leaders here in the in the company, and not only is he great at real estate, he's very uh, good at other things as well. But anyway, come on up, and okay. I guess he's looking Perfect. for some people to add to his team. And so yeah, yeah so I'm just on the phone. Rick came in, so I'm a little like you know, dressed down. I have my <laughs> shoes on, so I'm uh, trying to get comfortable. <laughs> So, um, so he wants to show you how casual he can be. Yeah, there. yeah. I've got, you know, I got the suit, I got the coat and the tie. It's all sitting there. Um, so yeah, we're looking for people. Um, last year I closed 70 deals. Uh, our goal this year is 90 to 100. And uh, we have one buyer agent. We have two admin. We're looking for a dialer. Uh, people come on our team, they start as a dialer, which is an hourly position where they get spiffs on, on closed deals. Now, what's great about that is it actually gives you an opportunity to learn incredibly quickly. Okay, because you're going to be exposed to every single objection you can within a two to three month period and you're going to learn all the answers to all those. Okay, it's kind of like a boot camp position, but for someone who's truly looking to do this, who wants to make this them, they want to become a really good agent, they want to do this, I can't think of a better way for someone to start out than in a position like this, you're in the same room as I am and we're, we're pounding out calls together, we're sitting down and if you get off the phone, something happens. Hey, what, what happened here? What, why did they hang up? What did they say? So if that's something that interests you, the main thing is that we're looking for people, we're looking for people long term. Um, we have a vision of creating a team where we're going to close 150 deals and then have the possibility basically of taking that and creating and moving that team to different markets. We have big plans to work for long term people. So we've interviewed a ton of people um, and um, we've got great people on the team. Alicia's been with me three and a half years. Uh, Ricky, I've known for over three years, is also one of our admin, and she's actually has some business coaching experience as well. And then Jesus is our buyer agent, and we're looking for someone else to come in. We're going to be putting as many as one, two together on dialers, and then you can move up to be a listing agent, be up to buyer agent. It is an opportunity. It's We're looking at it as a 10-year opportunity, and we're looking for people to join our family. Our team is our family, and it's a little different than other teams. I'm just not looking for someone to come on and be six months as a buyer agent and turn and burn and just throw leads at them. We're looking to have you come in, learn this business. You will also get leads, especially as a buyer agent. We do some of that as well. It's a much different situation. But we've got a long-term vision and a long-term plan, and we're looking for people who want to be a part of that long-term. So if that's something that interests you, we'd love to talk to you. We actually have, really, it's about a three or four step interview process. It's not just like, you know, joining a team, becoming a buyer agent, and just having things uh, thrown at you. So we're looking for people. It's going to be a good fit for them and for us. So, yeah. any questions? Joe's over in the corner. If you guys have any other questions, you can come and ask Russ and I also. So. Uh, but a great, great opportunity here. So give it some thought. What was your last name? Reardon, R-E-A-R-D-O-N. Okay. So, Fantastic um, trumpet player. Yeah, that's, that, that was my previous life. I was a professional musician in New York City for, for years and years. Um, and I'm also an investor. So part of the other thing too is um, our goal for everyone on the team is for them is for them to become a millionaire through investing and through real estate. And we're working on that for everyone, that they're going on that path. I currently own 21 doors and I'm looking to get add another 10 to 15 this year, depending upon the deals I get and the 10th ring exchanges I do. So um, that's another part of the puzzle too. Okay, thank you so much, awesome. really appreciate Thanks it. Joe. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. All right, you guys ready to do dot loop and zap now? Oh, we're ready. <laughs> <coughs> I'm ready, I'm nervous. You're nervous? I don't want it to go over my head like the last time. So, oh, so, so, <laughs> I, so I was about to say, we're going to go kind of fast. Is that not a good oh, thing? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we won't go too far. Right? That is recording, yes. So, um, all right, so in terms of how many of you have been into, I get, first want to get a feel for like where everyone's at. How many of you have been into Dot Loop? Personally? Yeah, personally. So about half-ish then, okay. How many of you are, feel like you're pretty comfortable with it? 
the same hands. Okay, well, good. Awesome. I, I know the person who I, I ask. I ask Amy. <laughs> okay, good. So uh, let me kind of just, for those that aren't aware, let me explain what dot loop is. So dot loop, the purpose of dot loop is twofold, really, for us as a company. For you, in terms of as an agent, the value of dot loop is this is a place that you can store all of your documents and and really more so than even storing the documents what you want to use this for is a way to have your clients sign um, any of the documents so you now you don't have to do it through here but it is a great way to make things a lot simpler on you to getting their, them to sign it now with that being said though one of the things I want to caution you with in terms of using dot loop as we get into this is make sure that you are still explaining the documents to the to your clients um, and I think I shared with you guys but I'll, I'll briefly share it again I'm on the professional standards uh, committee at the Salt Lake Board we had recently a uh, hearing that we did where a agent was trying it was, this was an arbitration to decide who was going to get the commission and the agent who filed the arbitration came in saying I had agency signed with this buyer this other agent went ahead showed him a house wrote an offer and closed on the deal and I should get paid though because I had agency before that agent did now in the process of going through all of this the uh, the act client themselves had written us a letter and one of the things they said in their letter was that their agent had used DocuSign, so they didn't use dot loop, but it was DocuSign, and they said part of the problem was they didn't, the agent didn't explain to me what documents I was signing. They just said, if you want to write this offer, I'll send it to you through DocuSign. You can just sign. The client said, we didn't know what we were signing. They didn't explain anything. We just went through and clicked the button. Now, do you think for that client, do you think just going through and clicking gets them off the hook no. but how many of you have done that yeah and the rest of you are liars right <laughs> you stop and read every single thing before you click it right but on a paper if it's a physical paper and the realtor saying just put your initial here and sign here and correct do that, they aren't going to read everything they're thinking there's no time just sign everything correct let good. me just brief it very okay. good point. Okay. That very good point is that yet yeah, there's no difference that if a, if then sitting down in front of a client with an actual piece of paper and just saying initial here, initial here, and sign here, they could come in and say, well, I didn't know what I was signing. Now I have a little bit more though of a of an understanding because I've done it. I've been the guy that just clicks and doesn't bother to stop and read what I'm clicking on. So for for us sitting there in that hearing panel what happened is we gave actually the commission to the second person not to the first person who had agency signed part of that there was more to it than really what i'm getting into with you but part of it was every one of us was there thinking well yeah i can understand that if the agent didn't tell them included in this is also a buyer agency agreement which means that 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 if, if they would have had something like that so so my point is as you use this system it's a great way of simplifying things to get initials and signatures from our clients but that does not absolve you of the responsibility of re explaining to them what the document is what it means those type of things so I would recommend as you use this system to as you send it to them there's a spot and I'll show you where you can type in a message I would type in a message explaining what it is I would also do as much as you can to document that you explained what documents were to them if if the agent had had something like that a message that had said to us here are the documents you're signing and here's what they mean we probably would have said to the first agent yeah, you're right. You were entitled to this. They, you know, why the client kind of took advantage of you in this scenario rather than just moving on. So does that make sense? So that's kind of what the system. So the other piece of this dot loop system, though, is we as a company, this is our transaction management system. So no matter what, this is where all of we keep track of it. Meaning, if the division of real estate came in to us and said, we want to take a look at your transactions, this is it. We don't keep paper files of our transactions. Everything is kept right here. So as you're using the system, keep that in mind of, of as you're putting things into the loops, those type of things, 
Um, keep in mind, this is actually the filing system that we are using for the company, okay? So with that being said, when you first log in, this is what your system is gonna look like. It, when you first um, put in your email address and your password to log in, it's gonna drop you onto this screen. Now, your options when you get into here are, you have two different options. One is just to leave it like this if you like the looks of this. The other one is if you come up here to this little uh, blue thing right here where the mouse is. Oh, you know what? I gotta do one thing since we're recording this. Is this an this. app that you load into your computer, your laptop, whatever device you're using? Is it an app? Uh, you can so, use it, yes. Well, so how would it pop up if it wasn't on there? Or do you just go to it? To the app? Yeah, to the dot loop. I mean, is it just an app that once you get in, uh, I have a contract right now sitting on my computer ready for signatures. I don't have dot loop, so is that something that I have to have on my computer in order to get the signatures on there? Uh, great question. No, you don't have to have it on your computer. You just go to, like all I've done here is I'm in Google Chrome, is I just went to dotloop.com and hit enter and it'll bring you to a sign-in page. You do have access to dot loop. You may not have gone into it or no, but but yeah, but a, you just have Adrian resend it to you, your username and password. Your username is going to be your email address, and then the password will be whatever they, they default. But so you do have access to it right now. Okay. So, okay, so this little uh, blue thing right here, as you click on that, you can switch. Oh, apparently it's logged me out. So you can just decide. From here, it's just what's the view you like. Do you like seeing the little loops, or would you rather have it in the list view? I personally like this one better, but that's just me. So it's whatever you prefer up on that. But either way, if I wanted to create a new loop, I just kind of click on this right here, or from here, I just come and click Create Loop from here. Which So I'm going to do that from, for now. So, so from right here, I'm just going to hit Create Loop. The first thing it's asking me to do is to name the loop. Ideally, what you want to do is name the loop the address of the property. So if, it, if you're getting a new listing, you would want to type in the address of the property for that listing. If, it, if it's a buyer and you're writing an offer, use the address of the property. So what do you do, though, if you don't have, if you've got a buyer where maybe you're doing some buyer agency but you haven't found a property yet? Then what I would say is just type in the buyer's name there but then as you get an address to the property, you'll want to probably change that. So I'm just going to put in here, test for class. So you can see, as I start to type in though, if it, if it were an address, if I started to put in an address of a property, you can see it starts to guess what which property you're, you're using. They've, so they've got this tied to Google, so it's pulling up addresses from there. So. So I'm just going to name a test loop for class so that uh, the transaction coordinators will know what it is. The next thing you, you can do is it says select a template. So your options on selecting a template, as you click on that, is is it a new listing? Is it a buyer under contract? A new listing as a blank loop? Or a new a buyer under contract as a blank loop? And then relocation, listing, or buyer. Relocation and listing and buyer, you'll really only use those if you're involved with relocation. So you'll, meaning you'll know when you need to select those loops. Okay? Outside of that, you're really the option is do you want to select a new listing that is going to tell you basically the, the minimum documents you need. If you do the blank loop, it's not going to have anything there. So I'm going to go ahead and just do the new listing. Just, or actually, I'll do the buyer under contract just so you can see what it looks like. So if I click Create Loop, it's going to bring me right into here. So you can see now it's got the name of the loop here. And then down here it's showing for these under contract, here's the documents that you're going to need at a minimum. Now, the documents actually aren't there. See how they're grayed out? This is just like, think of it as a, it's a placeholder for those. So. Uh, probably the best way of explaining it would be to say, think about, go back in time to before the computer, you had a filing cabinet, 
And what we've done, what are you laughing at, Andy? That was a long time ago. <laughs> so you go back and you open up the filing cabinet, and inside the filing cabinet, you've got these files, and the files are named commission report, MLS printout, uh, confirmation of earnings money, but there's nothing in there in those file folders. It's just the folder and it's labeled for that. That's how you can think about this. This is that same thing. We've got the file folder sitting there. There's not, nothing in the folder. It's just the folder that says when you get the commission report, put it into this file folder. Everybody following me? Okay. So what we would want to do then, so let's come down here and let's say that on this, that it, I, it, I've just created this new loop. We haven't found a property. I'm just going to do the buyer broker agreement. So to add that in, I'm going to come over here to add file. When I click on that, then it says, do you want to add it from your computer? So it's meaning if I had um, had the actual client sign a physical document, and now I've scanned it in and saved it to my computer, would be the computer one. Well, I'm not doing that. I want to use the templates instead. So when I click on templates, that's going to now take me to within the system where all the templates are. And you have a personal uh, file, so you can, you can actually within this system, if you wanted to, you could create and store any personal documents that, that you wanted as well in here. You can just throw them into there. Um, this inbox would be uh, stuff that is sent into my inbox. Um, and this one is where you're mostly going to use, is this all C21 and MLS forms. So if I click on that, that has now loaded every one of the forms that we use. Okay, so from here, I could ju then just do a search for what I'm looking for. So now it's the buyer broker. So if I just start to type in buyer, it'll start to weed out what I'm looking for here. So you can see here's the exclusive buyer broker agreement, and then it gives you the options of here's a 295, a 395, 495, 595, 695 whatever you want to use. So I'll just say I want to use this 695 here. I can get the mouse over there. So select it and then copy. So it has now imported that into the system here. And you can see, so you can tell that it's actually there now because see how it's in bold there. So that document is, is actually there. The other piece that you want to keep an eye on is this right here. Notice that it's saying not submitted. So the not submitted means the office could come and find this if they wanted to go searching for it, but they don't know that it's there. So when you want to turn in a document, I'll show you how to do that in a minute, not yet, but um, you, this is how you'll know, have I submitted it to the office or not, is by what it says right here. So this will tell you, once, the, once it has been reviewed by our compliance department, it'll then say it's been approved in there. So you'll just keep an eye on this to know, have your documents been looked at? Are they approved? Is everything good with that, okay? All right, next step in this. So if I were doing this with a buyer and we were preparing to write an offer, I'd also throw in the due diligence and the uh, C21 receipt and acknowledgement of buyer due diligence. But for the sake of time, we'll just do this one document. So when I click on this now to load that document, it's going to give me the chance to autofill. Now the autofill is one of the great things about the system. So the autofill, what's going to happen is it's going to allow you to say who the buyers are, who the buyer agent is. If you've got an address for a property, you can put all that in there. Once you have put that information in here, every document that you add, it will then automatically uh, put the address of the property, the, all of those type of things. Make sense? So first thing I would want to do is identify who the buyer is. So I'm going to come over here and select the person. Now, because we this is a brand new loop, we haven't added anybody in there. There's no other than me There's and the staff here. There's nobody else in this loop. So I would just want to say, okay, add person. And I'm going to come up here and put in the name of the person. Billy Buyer. Okay, now the next piece of this, what you're going to be tempted to come over here and just say, oh, well, yeah, I want to add them to my team. Don't ever add them to your team. Have you done it, Andy? Is that no. why you're laughing? Oh, okay. No. You're just laughing. Not at intentionally. Me. Okay. So, <laughs> so, yeah, so don't add them to your team. The reason for that being is if, if you click add to my team, what you're telling the system is 
give this person to see everything give this person access to see everything in my loop and you may not necessarily want them to see everything in your loop such as your commission report and those type of things so don't add to the team unless it like for instance let's say that um, that uh, Erica was going to help me out with a buyer so like that she had said yeah I'll go show the properties and and help you whatever so we decided that we were going to team up on a buyer for some reason I would then want to add her to my team because I would want her to be able to see everything in the loop a so just list yeah think of it as like a co-list so the other time you would want to do it is if you had a, an assistant that was did all your processing and stuff then you would but for your actual clients don't do add for the team once you select add to the team you can't remove them you'd have to go start a whole new loop to it is the only way you could remove them from that so so don't add them to your team just put in their name and then their email address and, and if you've got phone number and all that you can put that in there Okay, and what's their role? They're the buyer. And I just come down here and say yes, add this person. And oh, before I do that, I can actually even do a, a message to them and send this intro email, which just introduces them to the system if you want to, to do that. Otherwise, I just say add person. So that person's now added in there. Who's the buyer's agent? It's going to be me. And autofill. So now what will happen is now the system, you can see, has gone through and placed the buyer's name where it needs to be, put my name where it needs to be. If I had had um, an address for a property and stuff, which this form doesn't really call for, I would put in all those there. So at this point, it's just a matter of going through and filling in the blanks. So saying, okay, on this blank day, a blank month, and year, um, and we, you know, we're not going to take the time to go through and explain all the fields on here, but um, so that's a separate class. But I would just go through and fill in all the blanks on this. And because, again, the other reason you want to have your client auto-filled rather than just typing it in is the other thing that it did that saves me time is that it automatically, to, the system automatically knows this is where the buyer needs to be initialing. So it's automatically dropped the initials in there. If I hadn't, so if I hadn't done the auto-fill, I could come here and select this and then come up here and assign this to whoever. And now you can see it's assigned for him to initial there as well. Make sense? Am I going too fast or too slow? Just right. So it just assumes the first and last initials. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great question though. So now when they actually come in to sign though on that, when they click on it to sign, the initial thing that it's going to ask them is to set up how they want their initials. So even though it's BB, if he was going to be signing it as B, 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 I don't know, whatever. He, would, he could change that and have it be whatever he wants it to be. And then it'll, it'll change it there. Up on the autofill? Uh, no, when the client, just when the client goes to actually initial it. But there was a place up there for the signature, right? For the person's name that this contract was for? Yes. All right. Yeah, so when he goes to sign it, though, it'll bring it up and it'll basically have him choose what he wants his signature to look like. And and to say so like for instance on mine my login as you've seen on here is Russ Orchard but typically I don't sign it that way when it when I go in to actually sign I'll add ELL to it so that it's Russell instead of Russ Does that makes sense <coughs> So I can always change well in fact I'll even just show you that piece of what that looks like so at the end of the form here's it's got a space for for Billy to sign and then it's got for me so I can do sign now and then it brings it up just like this. Well, so I've already got it set to be that way, but if I wanted to change it, I can come in RKO. <laughs> and change it to like that. I could change my initials over here if I didn't want that showing. So they can change, oops, if I can find the right button and get rid of it. There. Okay. So the other thing is if I actually wanted to draw my signature, I can hit that and now, I'm left-handed and I'm using my right hand. That's my excuse here. Oh, yeah. Although you guys have seen me write on the board enough that you might say, hey, maybe you're really right-handed. Anyway, so I could adopt that and sign. Oh, initials are required. 
<laughs> Looks like my grandma did it, right? <laughs> or your one year old. <laughs> oh, ow. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, okay, so that's how, so you can see once I've done it. The other thing to show you in this is it automatically puts the date and the time that that has taken place as well. So from here now, for my client, what I would do, I would go through, get all this form filled out, and then I would just do save and share. When I click save and share, it automatically brings up, it knows that we've got four fields assigned for Billy Buyer, so it's automatically putting him in there. If I had somebody else that I wanted to send it to, to just view it, to view the document, I could type in their name, email address, and you'll notice over here the options. So the different options, losing my voice. Uh, the different options that you have is either view only, which obviously is what it says, they can only view. Can sign is going to allow them to sign. Can fill and sign would let them fill out the form and then sign it, and then can edit in private. So typically, really with your clients, you're pretty much only going to do the can sign. There's one document that you might do the can fill and sign, and I'll say more about that in a minute. But so from here, this is where I was telling you, from here is where I would want to, if I was going to be sending this to him, I would want to enter a custom message here to explain what is it I'm sending to him. So enter a custom message and I would recommend typing in there, here's the buyer's agency agreement, this is, this is the document that says I'm going to be representing you. I mean, give them a little bit of information about what it is they're signing. Again, it's just one more layer of protection that if somebody came back saying, well, I didn't know what I was signing, signing we can say, well, number one, you shouldn't have probably signed it then. But two is we've got this showing that we um, explained what it was we had sent to you. So, And then from here, the other thing, if I wanted, I can do attach PDF. So let me explain the difference here. So when I'm sharing the document, notice it doesn't say send the document. So you, the document actually is not leaving the system and going to your client. What's happening is you're basically inviting them in to the dot loop system to be able to see this document. So think of it as it's not, you're really not actually necessarily sending them the document. They can download it if they want, but you're just sharing them to go into it. So essentially it's like you're inviting them into the office to actually come in and sign this document and, and then leave without it, sort of. But so they, you they have, have a part of it, it and they have a part of it. Correct. That's a sharing. Question? No. Oh, good. So, um, so as I share this with them, that's what it's not actually going to them. So if I actually want them to actually get a PDF version of it, I would just attach the PDF here, and then as it sends it to them, then they can actually open it up and save it right to their computer. Now, I mean, like I said, in the system itself, they still can download it and save it to their their file. So you don't have to attach a PDF. I typically just do that if it's somebody who's never used the system before because they may want to print it off and it's just an easier way to print it. Yeah, I would say for like other realtors that yeah. want to fuss about the dot loop, the system that you attach it to an email. Yeah. Because that way, again, you have your copy rather than just doing everything, put, putting it in a different system and then trying to email it to them. This is just so much faster. Yeah, so that typically, for sure, when I'm sending it to another agent, I always do the attach PDF because they may not either know how to use dot loop or just may not care to, whatever, And but it gives them both options that way. So once I hit share on this, then it's going to then send an email to that buyer, okay? So let me back out of here and I'll show you what that looks like here. Once I have sent that document, you'll notice here it's added this waiting on others. And when you hover over it, it'll tell you here where it says still waiting on Billy to sign. Now, if I had sent it to a husband and wife, and let's say she had gone in and signed it and he hadn't yet, it will tell me right there on this waiting for others that she has signed it, he is, is still wait, it's still waiting for him to sign. If he had actually even looked at it but not signed it yet, it would tell me she's signed it, he has viewed it but not signed yet. So that's the nice thing is it this this gives you a great tracking system for all your documents as well is being able to see you can always at any time go in and see the date and time that anybody looked at a document. So again, another layer of security of somebody saying, "Well, I never got it." We have proof if they actually did open it and look at it. You can you can see that. So So it, that means a space has been left without a signature and that's why that pops up like that. Correct. Okay. Yep. Yep. 
And yeah, in fact, if he had started signing but hadn't finished, it would say he had started signing. It would let you know. I don't remember the exact wording, but it'll let you know that he has signed so many spots or whatever. So you'll kind of know what's going on along the way. Once it is signed, then this will change to just saying signed, so you'll know that it has been signed by everyone. All right. What questions on? And doesn't yeah, that send you an email? Doesn't that send you a fact that they have? Oh signed? yes, thank you. Yeah, once they do sign, it'll send you back an email as well, letting you know that they have signed. And that was that's for each document. So every document they sign, you'll get an email letting you know for that document that they have signed. So are you clicking on the boxes what that document is about? Are you clicking on those boxes on there? Yeah. No, not at this point because there's nothing there. Remember, this is just a like a this is just a placeholder right now for these. This one though, I could. So this buyer broker one, if I came and click on it, then it'll just open the document for me to go in and look at it. Oh, actually, let me do. Let me show you one thing. So the one thing you can do too. Let's say that the client actually wants to sign. You could take in either a tablet or a. Um, a computer that would allow you to to sign and you can do what's called a host and in-person signing so if I come over here to more right here gives me the option to host in-person signing when I click on that it's who you know select the person you want to sign so I say okay then it says hand over the controls to that person now so basically it's hand them your iPad or your tablet or whatever and then begin signing And that's going to bring up the document. And this is what it looks like for your client when they go in to sign. It'll say start signing. So they'll click start signing. Takes them to the first spot. Click here. So when they click, here's where it gives them again the option. Do they want to draw? Do they want to just click? So adopt and sign. So it's, it has done that one. And notice it's just stepping me through. As soon as I click on it, it's taking me to the next place I need to sign. So it just highlights everything you have to do at that moment. Yep. And then from here they say finish signing. And then it's letting them know, let me skip this, that it has been signed and then it'll try to, it'll ask them for a password so that they can access those, those documents at a later date if they want to. So, okay. Whoa. Not sure what happened. So I just always use this search field here to go find my loop. Here it is, test loop for class. And now you can see it says that he has gone in and signed that. So that's how I know. Go ahead. I have a question on that, mm -hmm. which is a filter. Okay, for some reason, I don't know what's wrong with me. It's not the system. I would love to blame it on the system, but every time I go in to uh, on a uh, already set up loop, and I go into uh, like right now, I have my buyers first. I mean, I, it's a personal preference whether you want to do it address or, but I have my buyer in there, so um, I put their name in to search for the loop that I want, and I have to go to the filter and put under contract. That, why do I have to do that? Why doesn't it, when I write in the last name or the address, whatever, why doesn't it automatically do that? Why do I have to go to a filter? So I, had cl I cleared the filters so that it should bring it up no matter what. What am I doing wrong? Uh, I don't know that you're doing anything wrong. Let me kind of bring everybody else up to speed of what you're asking. Sorry, okay. don't That's okay. That. So there are filters here. So one of the things you can do is you can, you can filter out different things of what you want to be able to see so that when your loops load or when you're, if you're searching for a loop you could say I only want to see them that have no status or they're private or they're active listings or under contracts uh, any of those type of things so that's kind of more what she's talking about is is but you should be able to go in and set up those filters and then it should keep should remember and keep them but it's not I probably would recommend calling into Dot Loop then. 
okay. and talk to them. Now, which actually, that's a good segue. It's something I probably wouldn't have thought to tell you guys. Let me explain one piece to this, because most people don't know this. Um, up here, under where my initials are, I can go into my account here. Under your account settings, it'll it, you can see it's got my information in here. Typically, it's going to default to not having your phone number here. If when you call dot loop, so if, so if Wanda goes and calls to ask them this question, the system looks for the phone looks at the phone number that you're calling from. So when you call in, it looks at the the phone number you're calling from and then matches it up to one in the system. And if if you so if you didn't have a phone number and you call into them, they prioritize their calls based on who you are, basically. Meaning. If, if the system looks and that phone number doesn't exist in the system, it assumes that you are not even a customer, and so you go to the bottom of the list. Versus because our whole company, because we're paying for a company account, you're going to have a higher priority than just even a regular agent that's with another company that they don't have a company version of this. That you, does that make sense? So by having the phone number in that you call from gives you a higher priority and in getting your phone call answered, you'll go higher up in the list. So that's just a little uh, secret little tip that they don't actually talk much about. But when I got trained on this system, they actually flew me back to Cincinnati to get, to be trained by Dot Loop, and that was one of the things they told us. That is something they don't talk a lot about, but it's something that'll help you if you ever do have a question of calling to them. Okay. The other thing while I'm in here that you um, can do is decide on your notifications, uh, you know, what type of notifications you want to receive. So if you go through your different profiles and document preferences and things under this is, is a good idea. So, all right, let me go back here to the loop. Okay, so within the loop, let's say that he has signed it now. Now, one of the things for you guys, just in terms of when a client signs buyer agency like this, you don't need to turn that into the office right then. Just hold it, leave it in here for yourself. When you're going to turn this into the office is once we actually have an accepted contract on a property. So I could do all of my documents and stuff. I could add you know, the REPC, the due diligence, all this stuff in here. But I'm not going to do anything with it beyond just adding the documents, getting my client to sign it. It's all just for me at that point. But, so let's just assume, though, that I've gone through and done the REPC. We've, we've negotiated with the listing agent or the seller. We've got an acceptance. They've now accepted our offer. Now I need to turn it into the office. What you want to do is go through and either select all of the forms, or you can come up and just select um, the, this folder. Oops. And you want to do a submit to review. Now, once I click submit for review, it's going to come in and now remember I didn't have a property address before. So now it's saying put in the address. Well, I still don't have one because this isn't a real loop. But if I did, this is where I could put in the actual street name of the property that I've either listed or that we now have put under contract. And then I'm gonna, it's going to just step me through the system to turn it in. Once I hit, some, hit next on that, then what happens is it sends it to the transaction coordinators, letting them know, okay, this, this document needs to be reviewed and, and taken care of in terms of from the company side of things. Does that make sense? So then what will happen is then up in compliance, they will take a look at your, all of the documents. If you're missing any initials, if they have any questions, anything like that, they will send this loop back to you with so you'll receive an email saying they sent it back with whatever questions or telling you you're missing this document or this signature or any of that kind of stuff. Does that make sense? They notice everything. Say that again. They notice everything. Yeah, that's, well, that's right. That's that is what we, their job. Their job is to keep you. <laughs> Check out, yeah. Oh, which brings up a good point, actually. There's something else I need to show you. Oh, we're going to have a hard time even getting to that. But, okay. Um, 
Yeah, so yeah, what Eric's saying is exactly right. Their job is to protect you. And so if there's anything missing that's not right, they're sending it back to you to fix it. Okay? And it'll so, say return to realtor. That's right. So let's say on this buyer broker agreement, now remember, we've had the client already sign this. If for some reason I came in here, and this is just to, you know, any of you that have devious thoughts, I'm going to fix it so you can go, okay, well, I can't do that then. So, but let's say that I came in here and I wanted to change something on this. Now remember, this has all been initialed by the client, right? If I came in here and said, um, all right, you know what, I don't really want to represent this guy anymore. Let me change it. So as soon as I start to change the document, notice it popped up and said, because you're about to modify a signed document, a new version of this document we've created without signatures. Afterwards, you'll need to reshare the document to obtain new signatures to approve your changes. So if I go in and change something, it wipes the signatures out from your client, Andy. And one thing that happens if you let them do the fill and sign or anything, yeah. and they change, I had that happen, and we went out of the contract, it was weird, because I allowed them to change something and erase all the signatures from the seller and the buyer, and my rep C and everything. Yeah, so remember what I was saying, when you share it to the client, the options are can view, can sign, or can edit and sign. If you give them the can edit, and they've already, so typically where you'll run into this issue is on the seller disclosures. You'll send it to both the husband and the wife. The husband will go through, fill out the document, and sign it. And then the wife jumps in and looks at it and goes, hey, you forgot, we had a flood in the basement that one time, and clicks a box to change it. And then it pops up and says this, and they don't stop and read it typically. They just go, okay, yeah, that's fine. And they say, continue. And as soon as you say continue now, you'll notice all of the signatures, come on, are gone. See, even including mine, it took, takes everything off. So, so typically on those seller disclosures, if the husband fills it out and signs it, and then the wife makes a change to it, and then she signs it, you'll end up coming back saying to the husband, hey, I need you to sign. Well, I did. I already went through and signed it. So if that ever happens, that's, you can know that means the wife must have edited something. And again, you can always go look at the history of the document to see what happened, but the husband will have to re-sign again. So th the beauty in this is it stops you, or not you guys, but you know some agents out there, from going in and saying, oh, okay, now that we've got this signed, let me go in and change it to, you know, say something different than, than what they thought they signed. So that's the layer of protection in there to, to keep that. Okay? All right, what else? The other thing just to, to show you, really, I mean, the biggest thing I would recommend for you guys, get in and play with it. Just get in and, and put together some loops. Just make sure you do type in that it's a test if it's one that's not a real loop that you're doing something with. Just so that if you do accidentally submit it for review, they can tell quickly that it was a test. It's not. Uh, go to the archive, that what they can do with that. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah, one of the things that, that you want to do, as I was saying, is you want to kind of keep this clean as you can. It is possible that maybe I put in this buyer broker agreement, well, maybe not that one, but that you have some documents that you end up either not wanting to use anymore or whatever. One of the things with this system is you cannot delete anything. You can't, nothing ever will be deleted. It stays there, okay? So, but you can archive it, which is what Wanda's talking about. So let's say that I had had them sign this and then come to find out Billy really, I only had him sign it, but let's say then we found out that he doesn't even have a job, that you know his wife's the one who's working and she's get qualifying on the property and we didn't even have her sign anything. So we really don't need him anymore. So I could come in here and get rid of that document. The way to get rid of it is these three dots over here to the side and I just hit archive and you can see it gets rid of that document. Out of, the, out of the loop. So it's still there, it's just uh, under the archive. So this is the filter that Wanda was talking about. If I wanted to get it back, you can see up here at the top right, show archived. If I ever needed to see that document again, I just hit show archived and it's back in there again. Yep. Hide the archived and it's gone. So that's a way to keep your loops clean so that there's just not tons of things just floating out there. And you uh, can rename uh, something too. Like sometimes, yeah. um, Depending, if I'm taking a, 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 a 
document from my computer and it's named and it's not the name I really want it to be under, then you can go in and show them how you can change that. Yeah, yeah in fact, let me do one other thing as we're doing that. So here's this, the placeholder for Repsi. If I come into the templates here, so we'll kind of hit two birds with one stone. If I went in and I'll just grab this confirmation of agency now, but remember I selected this under the Repsi tab. So notice this says Repsi, but if I click on it, it's not the Repsi because that's not what I put there. Now again, go back to the filing cabinet. If you had a file that said the Repsi goes here and you put in the confirmation of earnest money into that folder that says Repsi, you're still going to think it's the Repsi until you actually open the folder, right? That's just think of this as that same way. So even though it says Repsi, when I clicked on it, it's the actual document I put there, which is this confirmation of earnest. Okay. So what what Wanda's talking about? Is if I wanted to rename this document, and actually I haven't tried this in these placeholders, but I can come here and hit rename, and then I can change it to Ernest Money Receipt. Now it's saying what it really is. Does that make sense? You guys look so excited. <laughs> <laughs> All right, should I move on to the What about the download? Oh, if you want to download? Okay, great question. Yes. So over here, again, if I wanted to download the whole thing, I can select that and then up, up, it, notice those blue options, links pop up or disappear based on what's selected. So up here, I could archive this whole folder if I wanted. So <coughs> an example of that would be we have to keep any... I know we got a jet and take it off here for some reason, but um, let's say that on this under contract that we had written this offer and we submitted it, but we ours got rejected or whatever. I could rename this loop to rejected offer on whatever property uh, if I wanted to. I can add new um, places, new folders and things in here of, of all of those things. But yeah, so to open, print, or download would be from here. So I could archive that whole uh, folder if I wanted. I could make a copy of it if I needed to. I can open it, I can print, or download. So if I just click this download, then stand by and do it, and then you'll notice it's downloaded into my computer. So that's the same thing with your clients, and so if they wanted to print or whatever. So that, like I say, they can always go in and download it, but I usually just do attach to P a PDF when I send it to them so that they've got that. How do you, okay, it's all part of this, I'm not fearing, but I have a problem going in and getting it from another source and putting it into there. Would Put you it. show us how to do that? Okay, yeah. So if, and when you say from another source, meaning off well, my computer? You can your computer okay. or if someone's, or if another agent sends it through, email, an email okay. or whatever. Yep. Perfect. Okay, so now this one is down here. So let's say I wanted to add the printout here. I come up and hit add file. Do I want to add it from the template? This one I'm going to do from computer. So it's going to pop up here and give me the option to select where it's saved on my computer. It has to be a PDF file. I was going to say, what's the best no, way to you. save it so that you can go get it? Yeah, it has to be a PDF. If you were trying to do to input a Word document or Excel or something, it won't, it won't do it. It's got to be a PDF. So here's the earnest money receipt. I would just find it, so let hit the click on it and open. Maybe. And it's dropped it in. Now you notice it's calling it MLS printout because that's where the placeholder is. So I can change the name there. The, the other option though of what Wanda's talking about is let's say that. Um, I have gotten a, a, a counter offer from them, okay? So they've emailed me a counter offer. You'll notice there's not a spot in here for counter offers. We don't, we don't assume every time that there's gonna be one. So I would need to add the document for that. So I come up here and click add document, and then it gives me the option. Do I wanna get it from the templates, which is the same thing we've done, or um, 
off my computer, so browsing from my computer, or from an email. So the nice thing is if they had sent me an email and I click on this email right here, this is the email address for that exact folder inside that loop. So if what I would do then is copy this to the clipboard. So it's got the email copied to the clipboard. Then I would go to that email the client had sent to me, click forward, and paste in that email address that we just copied to the clipboard and send. And then it'll automatically upload that document right into your folder in .loop. What's the clipboard? <laughs> <laughs> I know, I probably should. Yeah, it's basically so just a copy and paste. So essentially, anytime you do a copy and paste, when you copy, it's really putting it to your clipboard is what they, they call it. So it, it's just a copy and paste. You're just copying this email address. You're going to paste it in. So you just think of it as you're going to forward an email to like the office or to me. If you hit forward, you would typically type in my email address. Instead, you're going to type in which I would never type this, that's why you do the copy. But if you did type in loop dash test loop for class dash under contract documents dash and all of that at upload dot dot loop dot com, when you hit send on your email, it sends it then to that folder in dot loop. So you don't actually have to upload it at all, it just automatically. Can't you just forward your email directly to your dot loop email? Then it will come into your inbox and then you Kind of yeah, that would be the other option. The other option would be to do that. That's what that inbox was. So when I was was getting from templates in the inbox, this is just way easier. Yeah, because this way, this way you're just hitting that copy button. It puts that there, and then just do Control V in your on your email to forward. Hit send, and it'll automatically drop it right into this folder. So then you it just removes one step from having to do that. Does that make sense? All right. What other questions on dot loop? If not, I'm going to jump into zap. Zap. Three. So what's the difference between loop and zap? Good question. Dot loop is where all of our documents are. Zap is going to be where you're going to store all of your um, is your CRM, your contacts, your SOI, that type of thing. Okay. So uh, on zap now. On zap, there are a number of um, videos that if you want to watch extra training videos on zap that if you go to 21 online under the tool library there's a thing that says easy zap if you go to there there's tons of training videos I mean we could spend hours on this and we've got like 20 minutes <laughs> so what I'm going to show you basically is just how to set it up how to get it set up again just go in and play with it okay so when you first log in which you're log in to get into zap I don't know why, but they have not given it given us a uh, a link to it out of 21 online. So where I was just saying, if you go to 21 online and go into the tool library, you'll see Easy Zap. If you click on that, that's just going to take you to training videos. To actually get to the Zap system, you the URL that you want to type in on your computer up here is new.myzap.com. So you can see that right here in the in the box new.myzap. Dot com. When you type in new.myzap.com and hit enter, it's going to give you a username and password, a place to type in your username and password. Your username and password are exactly the same as 21 Online. If you ever change your password in 21 Online, it automatically changes it for Zap too. So it's the exact same. You don't have to remember an additional one. So they don't have a link. I don't know why, but it's the same username and password. So <laughs> So new.myzap.com. Now, so this is where you're going to keep this thing. This is a CRM, okay? It's a way for you to keep track of your clients. But the other thing that it, that you are given with this is you're also given a website that's your own website to use, okay? So that's what I mostly want to show you is how to get that set up for today. And then uh, we can, if you have other questions, we can do things later with it. So when you first log in, though, it's going to drop you onto this dashboard. Dashboard is really kind of where, on a daily basis, you'll go in and see what tasks do you have to do and what follow-ups do you have to do. So you can see I've got a task that's sitting in here right now. So your idea every day is to go in and clear out your tasks and any follow-ups that you have. I don't think I have any here. Oh, I do. 
So if I had a follow-up here, I should go in and do that follow-up and do my task to get that removed off of my dashboard. Okay? Twelve days overdue. I know I'm behind on that. <laughs> I hope I hope that this person, which happens to be me, would forgive me. All right. So, but what I want to show you is up here under your where your picture and your name are. If you click on that and go to my website, it's gonna. This is where you're gonna edit your website. Okay. So it's taking me here to showing me this is this is what the um, the banner is going to look like on my website. Here's my picture, and down here is where I'm going to do all my editing of, of the information about myself. Okay, but I'm just going to click on this view my website so you can see what it looks like. All of you have one of these right now, even though you may not be using it. So you can see here. It's got that photo of Salt Lake in the background. It's got my picture there. And then I haven't done a whole lot with this, as you can see. But this is where you want to go through and create all the content and stuff that you're going to put here. Okay? And the way you do that is back here under this My Website part, where I would come down here and type in information about me, put in professional information about myself there. Um, you've got the areas served. The, would say the areas you're going to work in, agent insights, any insights. The more of this type of stuff that you do, the better you'll do in the SEO. And then there's also an SEO playbook to help you with that that tells you, gives you a checklist of here's the things you should do in terms of SEO. So the first thing it's saying is you have a domain name, have it forward, have it forward visitors to your Zap site, make sure to forward it marketing. So what this is saying, is like I own russorchard.com, that domain name. So the first thing this is on this checklist is it's saying go out and forward that to my to the zap, which I've done. So if somebody were to go now to russorchard.com, notice it takes them right to my site. So and, and I've got it set to where it's what's called masked. So it's masked so that anywhere they go on the site up here it's just gonna show my name even though that's not really where they're at. Where they're really at is homesforsale.century21.com slash century-21 dash Everest Realty Group. It could be, that's, otherwise, to get people there, that's what you gotta tell them, is go to homesforsale.century21.com forward slash century-21 dash Everest dash Realty dash group dash 6471C forward slash Russ dash Orchard. I mean, obviously you don't want to do that, right? So instead, go purchase from GoDaddy the domain and then just forward yours there. And I can help you with that if you need help with it. That, okay, but that's something you have to buy, right? Yeah, yeah, but it, it costs like $12 a, a year. To purchase your own domain. Yeah. So okay, so you want to go through though and set, get this set up, do the uh, playbook, these resources, you can add um, other links and things to it, reviews, all that kind of stuff in there, okay? And again, you can't hurt anything, so just go play with it. Down here is the account settings. Underneath your account settings, so again, you're just going to keep coming up here to your name or your picture, start with the My Website, then go to account settings inside the account settings, the only thing really you're going to do in here is just checking your email signature. Make sure that your email signature is set up how you want it because as the system sends out emails to your um, contacts that are in here, it's going to automatically drop in this email signature. So um, as you look at this, it'll default to exactly like this. This is how yours will default. Notice it has my email address as russell.orchard at century21homes.com. Well, I don't really want that. I would rather just go to my Gmail. So I would just want to go in and type that in here to change that. And then save it right here. Just click save once you've changed that and then it'll save your um, email signature. That way any email that gets sent out will automatically uh, drop that in there. Your MLS memberships here this one you can't really change, but it'll just at least let you know which ones. For all of you guys, I don't think anybody here probably has access to anything but that one. So you should look just like mine. And then your lead zip codes. This is 
areas that you could receive new leads from. Now, on this though, there's there's kind of two pieces to this. One is this is saying where where would you want to receive leads from? The only way to change this is you have to give me the zip codes, send me an email <coughs> for the zip codes you want, and then I have to go in on the back side and put them in um, for the lead zip codes. Okay. The service markets though, so that's the lead zip codes there. The service markets, as I scroll, I can either scroll down or hit this to go to service markets. The service markets is a default that we have for everybody in the company. So everyone in the company, you're going to have everything in Utah, I believe now. There was one area that wasn't showing, oh good it is, is was Southwest Utah, but now everything. So all of Utah will be showing there for you as service markets. So that's all you're really going to need to do there. And then the last piece of this is lead notification and settings. As you go through these lead notification and settings, just make sure your phone number here is here and email address is there. Do you want to receive texts from the system? Meaning, if somebody goes to your website and registers on the site, do you want to be notified via text? So if yes, leave it as green. If not, turn it off. And then when do you want to be notified? and it gives you every day, and then you have a start and end time. 7 a.m. is the earliest, and 10 p.m. is the latest it'll let you go. But if for some reason you said, I don't ever want to receive any leads on Wednesday, you would just turn it off for Wednesdays. So that makes sense? And then down here is the automated email. When somebody goes to your site and registers, do you want the system to automatically send them a welcome email? Um, yes or no? And then what, what things do you want to be notified? Do you want to be notified every time you get a new lead? Do you want to be notified if a lead was reassigned? Uh, if there was a request for info, showing requests, listing appointments? So you just decide how you want to be notified on these if you do or don't. And do you want it by email and text, email only, or text only? So really, that's kind of your main thing on this, is just go through and get that set up. In terms of, uh, let me come back here to the dashboard. In terms of uh, using it and putting people in, if you wanted to start entering contacts in there, if you just come over here to contacts, that's going to just, by clicking on that, showing me all my contacts that I have in here. To add one, though, is right up here, this add. And at any time, anywhere in the system, you can go to add new contact, add new agent insights. So the agent insights is going to be, again, you could go in and type uh, your thoughts about a community or something, or what some of the highlights about different communities are on this agent insights. Or you could do that on, uh, or excuse me, yeah, local insights is the communities. Property insights, you could go and type information about, oh, I saw this property and it's really nice or whatever. So, um, if you have your contacts in another system, is there a way of being able to transfer those? To yes. Others? Yeah. What you have to do, I'll I'll um, have to help you with it. Okay. But what you do is just export them out of that system, and then we'll put them into Lead Router. Lead Router automatically then transfers them over to here. So we have to upload them to Lead Router. But now that we're not doing Lead Router, does it still have that opportunity to do it? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. So. We still are using Lead Router. The Lead, the lead Router system talks to this, is what happens. Uh, the only other thing, too, I guess, that I want to go through with you that's one of the coolest things probably about this whole Zap system is when you put a client in here, you can see I've got myself in here twice just testing or playing with it, but um, is it assigns a Zap score. So that Zap score is going to track how likely is this person based on their activity to be buying or selling? And, it, and you can see, I've got myself in here twice. This one says the chances are very high. This one is NA, so who knows? But what happens is on that, if I hover over it, it'll tell you what they've done. So this is saying, I'm showing very high activity relative to, the, to my other contacts. So again, it's comparing it to your other contacts out there. It's not necessarily just comparing it to nothing, you know what I mean? It's, it's saying relative to all of your contacts, this one's the most likely one to be doing something. 
So and then it tells you why. So it's saying that you know four or more weeks ago I requested info on a on a home, and then you'll notice once you get to a hundred contacts, then it'll rate them between one and a hundred. So the cool thing about this system is it in the the class that I teach on working the SOI that closed system. If you used this as a way of tracking all let's say two hundred people it's going to then rate them, or well let's do a hundred, say a hundred based on this. It's going to tell you one through a hundred so you know who your best one is and who your worst one is. So once you get to a hundred contacts, it's going to rate them one to a hundred. So that way thinking in terms of a closed system, if you had somebody new to add, you could easily say, well I want to get rid of the one that's number one and replace it with somebody else. So if you put in a call and you accept it, it shows that you talked to the person do you know, is that adjust their score? So when you're talking about your, yes. your SOI, if you've actually talked to them and you put it in there, it moves their score? Yes, if you talk to them, yeah. If you go through them, because somebody that you, if you said you got voicemail or something, it's gonna rate them lower than somebody you saying. So let me show you what he was talking about. So on this particular contact, let's say I were to call them. I was just going through making my calls. If I click on this, it's gonna take me in and say, okay, Here's the notes about the person that I've typed the last time. What number did I call and did I reach him, yes or no? So if I said no, I didn't reach him, it's not gonna give them as high a priority in the system as if somebody I said, yeah, I did reach and talk to them. Okay, thank you. And Question. then I would type in whatever notes and save. And then it's gonna say to me, do you wanna add them to a follow-up plan? Do you wanna set a priority date? And I'll say, yeah, I want to make sure to talk to them again next month on the 29th. This is a simpler version of Top Producer, isn't it? Yeah. Save it. And there you go. And the same thing I can do is sending an email from here. But the system will track, too. Are they opening your emails that you sent to them? Are they clicking on links for the things? The more, the more interaction that your contacts have with the system, the higher their ranking is going to be. So again, you'll know. The other thing is just as, as you set them up on this, it gives them access to your site that they can go in and search properties. As they go in and search properties, it's going to keep track of all that, letting you know, hey, your client, this particular contact has become active out searching of properties and things, so you'll know. And there is a place that you can click on to allow them to go in and look at your properties or the properties. Well, once you add them into here as a contact, it, it automatically a creates an account for them. Okay. Yep. So you could go in then under the contact. So this will be our last thing. So under this contact, if I um, were in here, I can do under these actions here, I can sign in as the contact. So that's gonna open me up to my website. So you'll notice it's dropped me onto my website. I could actually go in and enter a search criteria for that contact, save it, and then anytime a property comes up that meets that, it's gonna automatically email to them, which I think this is a great thing to do with your SOI, is go, you could go through and set up their neighborhood, what's going on in their neighborhood, save it, and then anytime a new property comes up for sale in their neighborhood, it'll email that to them. And if they, what you would want to start looking for is the people who start clicking on that and looking at the properties. If you notice somebody does that all the time, they're looking at it, that's a pretty good clue they're thinking about either buying or selling. So that'd be somebody you'd want to reach out to and talk to. The other thing that this site gives you access to do is they could actually go in and search properties for sale in other states as well. So any of the Century 21 companies that are using the ZAP system have given access to everybody else in Century 21. So people in other states could actually come and search on ours. And if they start to do that and search, say in uh, California or something, the system will send you an email saying, hey, this contact has started searching for properties in California. So you should contact them. The Espanol one, is See, that like enroll you in receiving Spanish-speaking contacts? I have no idea. I'm trying. Way up at the top. I would have, the above your top Century line. 21. I would have, well, no, you know what, no. I think what That's it does where it's is it's just going to switch the site to. Just translates it. Yeah. 
Presentamos en Bolivos. But if you spoke Spanish and, and you could work with, this won't give you uh, leads that are speak Spanish. Well, it would because if people were on searching this way, I mean, your site's not going to just go out and generate leads automatically. You're going to have to do something to get it marketed to people. Okay. So if you if you did have it like this, you could and created some mailer pieces or something. Is what you want to do. So that would be So really, at this point, I guess, guys, the biggest thing is get in and play with it. Um, the other thing, let me just uh, actually I'll end it with this. Let me just show you on 21 Online. If you go to 21 Online, Want to want to learn more about it on on Zap? Well, I could. Well, there's two ways to go about it. One is just through 21 Online. If you go all the way to the end, you'll either see Easy Zap right there, or you'll see it as the very last thing here. This Zap Easy Zap. If I click on that, that's going to bring up a bunch of training videos. The other option is inside of Zap. If you come over here to support, if you just typed in what you were looking for, it'll uh, show you how to do it there as well. So this would be, if you know specifically what you're looking for, I would say type it in there. Otherwise, if you just want to get some more basic training, go to 21 online, click on the easy zap, and eventually it'll load here. And it's got a bunch of different videos that uh, it'll kind of walk you through from the basics to, to more experience. So down here, this watch a video, if I click on that, here's all the videos on Get to Know Zap. Here's the ones on setting up your agent site, how to drive traffic to your site, how to manage your leads, and how to promote yourself. So you can see there's tons of videos to them. And then the other option is I'll be glad to sit down with you and kind of help you with any of that too. So anyway, 11:29. I said we'd be done at 11.30. Thanks for being here. No. Everybody's going to the summit, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, bro. Get over there and uh, get in. Okay, so for the question. So I do have two in the red. And I know why I'm using the red to get a little bit of One of them is just a strictly for number one. I'm trying to get a little bit of a response. So I just want to do it. Um, I did switch it.